Almost 800 years after his death, the spirituality of St. Dominic continues to call men to faith and the traditional charism of preaching. We'll talk with two Dominicans tonight and explore the key elements of Dominican religious life. So please stay with us. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Paco and welcome to EWTN Live, our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. Before we get to the two guests that we have tonight, I want to mention that today is the feast of St. Elizabeth of Hungary. She was born in 1207 and when she was only four years old, well, as soon as she was born, she was promised to be married to a, a prince from another place. Her dad was the king of Hungary. And when she was four years old, she went to move in with her future husband's family. By the time she was 14, she was married, and they began to have a number of children. Now, uh, the three children all together. The husband went off to the Crusades and died of plague during the Crusades. And this led to a great deal of suffering by, by the saint, because uh, St. Elizabeth was left with the kids, and other people wanted power. And so they wanted to get rid of her and the kids, and so they moved her out of the castle and all. But through it, she was very committed to helping the poor. And she worked with uh, Franciscans who gave her her spiritual direction, and she was able to help out the poor of the kingdom and bring them food, clothing, hospital care, and she was willing to give up all of her own luxury and wealth in order to help the poor. So for that, she was uh, uh, canonized in 1235 by Pope Gregory the Great, uh, Pope Gregory the Ninth. Also, it's important to note that she's not only respected in the Catholic Church, but also the Anglican and Lutheran churches have great respect for her as well because the, she was so important to the, the care for the poor that every Christian should have a sense of. All right, tonight we have two guests, and both of them are Dominicans from the province of St. Joseph. And they're here to help us understand the charism of St. Dominic and what it means to be a member of the Dominican order. So please welcome Father Benedict Crowell and Father Nicanor Austriaco. Father Nicanor, Thank you very much. good to have you. Father Benedict, Thank you. welcome. Good Thank to have you all here. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Uh, now, Father Nicanor, where do you live? So I'm a Dominican priest currently assigned to the Priory at Providence College where I serve on the faculty uh, in the biology department as well as in the theology department. And Father Benedict? And I'm a Dominican priest also uh, in, uh, at the Dominican House of Studies in Washington, D.C., just across the street from the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. Yeah, it's a beautiful location that you have there. That's a nice place. Now, uh, you are not a teacher, I understand. No, I'm, I'm the vocation director. Yeah. And this is a, a lot of work to do because you have a lot of vocations. How yes. many did you have enter this year? Uh, this year we had, we had 21 novices enter the novitiate. And, and, and thanks be to God, they're still there. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. That's great. And a, and a lot of men uh, th that are coming up the ranks you know, the, the, yeah. in the pipeline. Yeah, it... Um, We've been extremely blessed, uh, and uh, it's really, there's no explanation except God's grace because we, uh, as, as Dominicans, we certainly don't deserve it, <laughs> but God has been so good to us, and, and many young men are, are, are contacting us and are interested in learning more about, about the Dominican friars, and yeah. uh, they're very, so it's, I'm, I'm amazed um, at, at the number of people that are, that, are, that are talking to us right now. Yeah. So. You know, this is something that uh, is going on in many dioceses as well. Many dioceses have seminaries that are full, but it's not quite so strong among the religious orders. 
Uh, some religious orders are doing well, but it sounds like you are really doing well, especially for one of the older orders. Mm -hmm. uh, you're doing extraordinarily well. Um, mm -hmm. What are some of the things that you find the young men are attracted to? What, what, what do they want to do? Um, well, from what I can tell, the, the, uh, the men that are contacting us are, are interested in the common life. They're interested in a strong fraternity, a strong common life, and, and a life of prayer, uh, a life dedicated to Jesus Christ, to following Him, and, uh, and, and, and ultimately to sharing the faith, pre the preaching of the gospel, which is what Dominicans were the order of preachers. So that's, that's what we're about. And As a matter of fact, at the end of your names, you put OP for order yes, of preachers. That's yeah. correct. Yeah, so the Lord, um, so uh, they contact us and they're just interested um, in just in finding more information, but, they're, but, but they're, their main interest, I would say, is, is uh, uh, there's, there's actually a, a number that are interested in, in St. Thomas Aquinas that, that, that write to us and also others. Um, well, what, well, what does that interest in St. Thomas Aquinas have to do with being interested in you guys? Well, because St. Thomas Aquinas is, uh, is one of our brothers, of course. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but uh, but he, he was after Dominic. He's, right. he's uh, yeah. I think that um, one of our brothers, uh, Archbishop Augustine de Noia, who currently serves the church in, uh, in the Holy See in, in Rome, put it best when he pointed out that we are living in, in, in a Dominican moment. There's a crisis of truth in our society, and as Dominicans, we are called to pursue truth. First, to pursue truth in the person of Jesus Christ, but also through study and the intellectual life, and then to preach that truth and to share that truth with our brothers and sisters who are trying to make sense of what's going on around them. And I think many of the young men who are coming to our life uh, have discovered some of the chaos of a world that's struggling with relativism and a strong individualism that has become divorced with an understanding of how we are created for God and how we're returning to God. And so when they discover that we are able to impact our society and by, by first discovering the truth in Christ and then preaching that, and do we do that together? I think that that's one of the things that they really they want to become a part of. They, they want to give their lives to something incredibly worthwhile. They don't just want to change history, they want to change eternity as well. Yeah, and um, I guess that one of the things that strikes me that, that um, was the same when, when I was coming through uh, is this, is this fact. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, it's, it's, it's the reality that some, there are many gaps uh, in, uh, in my catechesis when I was growing up. Uh, and, I, and I even went to Catholic school, but I didn't really understand the faith. Uh, I was even an altar server growing up, but I really didn't know, for example, why I genuflect when I walk into a Catholic church. And, and uh, when I discovered why I, genuf I genuflect when I walk into a Catholic church, namely the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, this just blew me away. And, and I would say that, that um, a number of the men are coming to us. They recognize that there, there's, there's a great need for people to, to understand the faith. Um, and, uh, and, and I would say that and they, they have a desire to share that faith and to teach the faith as well. Yeah, this is one of the things <clears throat> that I think in the, the, the 60s, sort of before your time, but, mm. you know, in the, in the 1960s, the idea of faith seeking understanding was not so strong a value. It was faith seeking experience that was the strong value and trying to develop either spiritualities or uh, social justice ministries in which you would have an experience of the faith, but not worrying about what does it really mean how do you really understand it? That was put on a back burner. And what you're saying is that the young men who are coming into your community are saying, no, that is something that we want to put on a front burner, that we want, to, we want to understand the faith better. Well, I think you want to understand the faith. You want to understand God because as part of our tradition, we, we, we as Dominicans are convinced that as you come to know God more, uh, you are attracted to him and to his beauty and to his goodness. And so necessarily you will grow in love for the God that you come to know. Mm -hmm. And so there's an intimate link between knowing and loving God. Yes. And so for us, 
the experience, the encounter with the risen Lord is simply a beginning, and then we come to try to understand who He is, and that response to, to the risen Lord necessarily impels us to go forward to speak to others about our encounter with Christ. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I'd want to act uh, or ask uh, about is um, some of the things of the daily order. You know, if, if they're attracted to the community life, what is there in the community life that's so attractive to them? Hmm. Well, there, there are certain elements uh, which we call uh, their we call them monastic observances, but they're actually uh, part of, of the conventual life because Dominicans are not monks, but the monastic observances are essential for the end, which is preaching, the preaching of the gospel for the salvation of souls. So, so th- that's one of the things to keep in mind. The goal or the, the end point is to preach the gospel. Exactly. So, so um, for St. Dominic, he, he wanted to found an order of, of, uh, of, of brothers, friars together, because the word friar means brother, um, that together could, could live a common life of prayer and of study for the apostolic end of preaching of the gospel for the salvation of souls. So there was, uh, these things were put together uh, beautifully um, and they were they belonged specifically to to the to the, to the bishop at the time uh, because at, um, at the time in the 13th century it was the bishop uh, of, of of the diocese is the one that would actually preach uh, and and teach and at the, at the time the clergy were not there were some problems and they were not they were not as well educated right. so 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 Saint Dominic had the the genius of of, of putting uh, a common life together. Uh, with with certain elements, so for example, silence. Uh, for Dominicans, uh, silence is the uh, is the father of preaching. So if we have silence and we have uh, the Word of God, uh, we have we have the sacraments. Those things together, um, uh, with our contemplation and prayer together, allow us to to preach the gospel uh, to the ends of the earth. And so. So for us, it was very necessary for uh, uh, for Saint Dominic to put these these elements of our life together, and um, Saint Thomas Aquinas coined uh, the phrase uh, in in the Summa Theologica, uh, question one eighty eight, where when uh, when he said that we contemplate and give to others the fruits of our contemplation. I mean that that's part of the key of the spirituality of Dominicans is that you contemplate and then give the fruit of that contemplation to others. I mean, it's, it, it, uh, as a professor, uh, what study is an integral part of my vocation as a professor. I'm also a molecular biologist. And so one of the things that I'm acutely aware of is that as p- actually doing research and doing experiments in the lab is one way that I can contribute to the salvation of souls. Not only because it's my little... Uh, corner of the Lord's Vineyard, and so my students and I are working together trying to discover the Creator who stands behind His creation, but also because in seeking truth everywhere, you're inevitably seeking God. And so we study in order to to preach, we study in order to uh, sanctify the world, um, because study is not always easy. And so for a Dominican, his desk is often his cross. And so for us, there's a penitential dimension to study. But in studying, we can also contribute uh, by uniting our, our study to the sacrifice of the Lord, to the salvation of the world. Now, um, this, the, this sense of going out, you know, um, this, this might be seen as something of attention because on one hand, your communities, uh, the young men coming in want to live a community life. And you know, part of that community life is having meals together, uh, prayer together, mass together. Mm-hmm. And there's a, there's a lot of things you do together. But you're not going to be preaching just in the community. Mm-hmm. You know, is there a tension between that going out from the community and being part of the community? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would say that the very nature of the, of the, of the Dominican vocation uh, is the end of preaching, <laughs> preaching the gospel for the salvation of souls. And that was specifically what Dominic had in mind, and, and he said that. It was laid down uh, in the first constitutions that, it, that, he, that he wrote. Um, and so, so um, 
and a necessary element of that, of that which we call apostolic preaching, uh, for the for uh, to preach the gospel, um, is it's it's necessary to have uh, the contemplative element as well. So, in other words, you it's not possible to give to somebody what you yourselves have not received. So, to reflect upon the Word of God and to consider uh, what the Lord is telling you first and uh, uh, for God's people. So that when you go out to preach the gospel, it's not just simply you speaking, but it's God speaking through you, especially uh, the Holy Spirit speaking uh, in what needs to be said and, and what needs to be preached. And, 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 and for us, that which needs to be preached is the truth of Jesus Christ, is the person of Jesus Christ. And if we can preach Jesus Christ in, in a way that's, that's attractive, if we can hold up, for example, the church's teachings, even some of the church's teachings which are quite difficult, but if we can point to the truth who is Jesus Christ, then people will see that truth who is Jesus and they'll be drawn to it themselves. It's not simply a matter of us, of us uh, telling people you know, that you must follow this church teaching or they must follow that church teaching. We have to be clear about the church's teachings regardless, definitely. But, but in the end, uh, Jesus Christ is the person that we, that we Jesus Christ and him, uh, uh, and him crucified risen from the dead and crucified. Uh, I'm sorry, crucified and risen from the dead. So if, if, Christ, if, if, if we're successful in doing that, then, then all the church's teachings fit together within, within that. And, and, and you know, I, um, I still remember my, uh, our professor, Archbishop Denoya, who's now Archbishop Denoya, um, he, he told, he said something to us once uh, when we were at the Dominican House of Studies in Washington. He told us, he said, he said that if, if ever you are preaching the gospel, and you are not drawing people into the uh, communion of God who is Father, Son, and Spirit, the interpersonal communion of who God is Father, Son, and Spirit. If you're not doing that when you're preaching the gospel, that somehow you failed. Because this is, this is the call for, uh, this, 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 is, this is the Christian message, message the, the, the distinctively Christian message of the gospel to draw people into that love, the love between God who is Father, Son, and Spirit. This invitation which overflows with love and goodness, which draws us into that communion with God. And I think that's, that also, uh, you know, um, I think would be characteristic of, of, of what we do. And it's not easy um, in order to, to preach the truth of the gospel, in order to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified, we have to be able to study. We have to, we have to study hard the philosophy and theology to be able to explain the church's teachings in an attractive way, in, uh, in, uh, in obviously in a way that, that engages the culture and doesn't just say, this is what the church teaches, therefore you must believe it. No, we have to, we have to engage the culture. If, we, if the Dominican does not engage the culture, then somehow we failed as well. Mm-hmm. Oh, and, and I think um, just to add to, to my brother's comments, I think one of the things that was so distinctive to me is that the Dominican approaches moral theology as a search for happiness. And so uh, when we go out to preach, we preach the truth of the gospel because it is in pursuing that truth that the human being ultimately finds the fulfillment of his deepest yearnings. And for me particularly, I'm a, I'm a Filipino I was born in the Philippines, and being a Filipino, I was inherently raised a Pelagian. In other words, for me, uh, when I was a kid... What, what is a Pelagian? A Pelagian, a Pelagian basically oh. believes that if you want to get to heaven, you've got to work really hard. And so if you didn't, if you didn't pass the test, it's because you didn't pray hard enough. Or, uh, and if you didn't get something, it's because you didn't do that extra rosary. And one of the things that uh, my brother Thomas Aquinas revealed to me in his works is that everything is grace, everything is God. And so it is in Christ and in Christ alone that we are saved. And it was so liberating to me to know that. And I want to go out and tell the world that I want to say, all you have to do is to tell the Lord that you are a sinner and that you need to be saved. And that is enough. I mean, I tell my students that so often they're, they're overwhelmed with the desire to just keep doing, to keep doing, to try to, to add up points. Uh, and I'm like, nope, it's all been done. Christ did it for us. And right now it's, it's, it's learning to cooperate with his grace and allowing him to change us and to make us into saints. And, and that's part of the adventure of Dominican life, not only to 
open yourself up to the Holy Spirit so that he can do that in you, but also allow him to use you as an instrument to go out there and to preach to your brothers and sisters. And, and in my, my particular case, to preach to the students that the Lord has sent to Providence College. And that includes, you know, working in the laboratories with Working them. in the laboratories, working side by side late into the night, but then being there when they have that question. They want to sit down. I'll never forget, there was one student, he came to me and he wanted to talk about genetics. But just as, I, as he was leaving my office, he said, you know, Father, I have one more question. And of course, I knew that this was the question he wanted to ask. And he'd been, in a sense, waiting for the opportunity. And he said, Father, you keep talking about Jesus Christ. How do I meet him? And for Dominican, that's, the, that's an incredible moment. Because for there, uh, you are being invited to, to share uh, and to point to the Savior uh, with one of your brothers who, who still hasn't come to know him. And it took two years of genetics to get that student to that point where he could actually ask that question. But that two years was worth it for that Dominican moment, for that moment of inquiry where uh, you are given the privilege of introducing him to Jesus. And what did you say to him? I said, you have to pray. I said, if you want to meet him, I want you to tonight, I want you to go to St. Dominic's Chapel on the way back to the dorm, and I want you to get there on your knees, and I want you to say, who are you? And I said, be careful, though, because he might smack you on the head, and he'll call you to the priesthood. <laughs> Did he? I don't know. He's still there. He's working as a technician now. Okay. That's a step. <laughs> it's one step towards salvation. He's actually one of the ones on our list. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't know. That's good. That's good. Uh, so, so... Th- one of the things that strikes me is, you know, the importance of this contemplation because it, without that element of you praying yourselves, then you could present brilliant lectures, but it would not be able to, to touch the, the souls of people the way that uh, something that comes out of contemplation does. Mm-hmm. Would you find that to be the case? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's uh, it's very possible to prepare a beautiful homily and to and to, you know, deliver it wonderfully and <laughs> to be all prepared. But if it hasn't come from uh, an abundance of contemplation, mm-hmm. uh, then and it hasn't come from the Lord, then then what good is it? Because it, it's our words. Because, um, you know, if 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 we, uh, okay, first of all, contemplation and prayer. Uh, uh, together with 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 our study, with the end of preaching the gospel, these things uh, play off each other, and they 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 uh, they they uh, nourish each other. And so and so so if if we we open our hearts to the Lord and, and ask ask Him to fill us with exactly what we need uh, for the, for for this for this homily that we're going to preach or this this group of students that we're going to talk to, uh, then and when we call upon the Holy Spirit, uh, you know. God wishes to give His goodness and His love right. and His mercy to, to to His people, and He's 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 going to use you. He's going to use the Dominican friar to to accomplish that. And we have to have, we have that that confidence, that expectant faith, to know that that God is is doing this. I mean, we you know, uh, with with it's it's with great humility that we that we look at the fact that we're the order of preachers and. And some of us, like myself, uh, get very nervous in front of crowds of people, and um, especially cameras. Um, but, but the fact is, is that is that is that if God has has given us this charism, He expects us to use it, and we we have to rise to the occasion. We have to trust that 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 His grace, His mercy, is with us to deliver um, a word from the Lord to to God's people for their salvation, and and something that to move them uh, to, uh, to come closer to Him. And so our, our, our preaching uh, necessarily also is, is, is doctrinal m- many times, but not just kind of boring doctrinal, you know, kind of, you know, kind of textbook doctrinal, but something that, 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 that touches their lives in such a way that they can, they can relate to it and yet at the same time to draw them into the mystery of who God is and who Jesus Christ is and the... And the um, I mean, really, the deep love that God has for us, that's what, that's what we, if, if, if we can communicate that to God's people, then, then they will respond. Yeah. They'll, yeah. they'll come to Him. Yeah. Do you have anything to add to that? Well, I mean, 
um, I've spent five years at a college and I've discovered that that age group between 18 to 21, 22, many of our younger brothers and sisters who are going to college, they come in ready to meet Christ. And part of the great privilege of, become, of being a Dominican on a college campus is that I actually live in one of the dormitories, so I'm a resident priest in one of the dormitories at PC. And so it's not uncommon well, that's to... PC is... Providence College. Okay, good. And it's not uncommon to get a phone call at 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, usually it's either... And I live in a men's dorm, so a guy's probably... The three scenarios I usually encounter are I got dumped father and I don't know what, what to do. Uh, someone in my family died or I'm not really sure about what to do in my future. And so you, they call you up at 2 in the morning... And so I say, well, hang on, let me just put my habit on, and then we go for a walk. And you have an opportunity there. You have an opportunity to preach, but not preaching here as in from the pulpit, but to share your encounter with Christ, my meeting him when I was back in graduate school, and sharing his grace and his message that will change a life and and give enough hope to your brother or to your sister so that... um, they will be able to be open to God's grace themselves and to encounter the living, the living God. I mean, for me, it's all about facilitating the encounter with Christ. And if, you, if you've never met Christ yourself, if you don't know what it's like to talk to him, um, then how is it that you will be able to share that with someone who's never met him, and who, who wants to meet him? And so... For us, the contemplation is getting to know Christ better every single day to sit there in the chapel in front of the tabernacle uh, to just spend time with him, to talk to him about the struggles of the day, to talk to him about the students that you've encountered. And then when it's ready to just get up, go into the lab and to do experiments, to actually work with them. And then at the end of the day, to carry their burdens and their sorrows as well as their joys back into the chapel and to share that with the Lord. That's an amazing life, and that's part of our charism. And um, I've had the experience, um, thanks be to God, of being in a parish also for four years. Uh, and, and being in the priory with my brother Dominicans uh, in uh, working in a parish has, uh, presents incredible opportunities also because we have particular situations that we're dealing with in the parish that are, that are pastoral situations that we have to deal with that are, that are problems or whatever, or things that need to be emphasized. And we don't do it alone. We have each other to kind of throw ideas off of. So like, for example, you know, even at, at, uh, at, the, at, at, at the common meal, for example, we can talk about certain situations and certain discussions theologically or, or pastorally that, you know, that, that are, you know, that, that really touch the life of the parish, for example. And so to be able to, 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 to have that that, that resource of each other and, and to talk things through. And then at the same time, we're also going to the chapel together and we're praying together. We're, you know, we, the Dominicans chant the choral office together. So we, so we, we, uh, we chant the liturgy of the hours, the Psalms, the same prayers that Jesus prayed. So we're discussing and we're praying and we're also uh, working together uh, and we're preaching the gospel together, you know, within the parish, hearing confessions together. Okay. All right. Well, look, we have to take a break. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for sharing this. But we're going to come back in a couple of minutes because we want to get your comments and your questions. So please stay with us.
Welcome back. Uh, if you would like more information about the Dominican Friars of St. Joseph, you can go to their website, which is www.dominicanfriars, as one word, dominicanfriars.org. Or you can also call them at 1-800-529-1205. So that's 1-800-529-1205. One two zero five, and they'll give you all kind of information about their community. And also, we've got a nice group of folks here in our studio audience, and it's mostly small groups and families from different parts of the country, from Kansas and Louisiana and Texas and um, Minnesota and other places. And we'd love to have you come and join us too. It makes it a lot more fun to have you here. So if you can make a pilgrimage here to EWTN, please contact our pilgrimage department. You can call them at 205-271-2966. That's 205-271-2966. Or go to our website, www.ewtn.com. And they'll help you with all kinds of information about scheduling for uh, the programs, uh, tours of the studios, uh, going to the masses, both here and in Hansville, and they'll help you find places where you can stay and go to eat and all the rest. So we'd love to have you come and join us. Uh, so please come on a pilgrimage here to EWTN. Are you two ready for some questions? Yep, sure. All right, good. Well, let's take a look. We have a call caller, first of all, David on the line. Hello, David. Good evening. Hi, where are you from? I'm calling from Utah. Great. And what's your question? Well, first, what a blessing for the province uh, with such a large group of novices. That's a, a great blessing. I'm interested in knowing how you would instill uh, and or nurture or culture for an aspiring friar the, the, the charism of your contemplative life and your active life. So um, that's a great question. That's a good question. That's a good question. So for somebody who's aspiring. Somebody who's aspiring, uh, how would you encourage them in the contemplative life and the life of preaching? Yeah, um, I mean, uh, uh, the first thing that I would suggest is, uh, is, is, to, is to develop your prayer life. Um, definitely, you know, uh, if, if, if you're actually aspiring to, to, to religious life, you might want to learn how to pray the church's prayer of, of the, the liturgy of the hour, some morning prayer and evening prayer at least. To begin to do that, um, and I, but I would say first and foremost would be would be daily mass. So you want to make sure that you could even, even pray with the with the with the readings before mass uh, each day, um, but but certainly daily mass would be essential. Um, and then if, if if it's possible to get in, uh, use some, some Eucharistic adoration each day. That would be, uh, or at least a few times a week. That would be uh, extremely helpful because some, because uh, Saint Dominic founded founded the order. Uh, as, as clerical, so we, we, we have cooperator brothers, and we have uh, we have we have contemplative nuns, we have active sisters, we also have the the Dominican laity, the third order Dominicans, but um, but but for the friars, friars are primarily uh, priests. So so if somebody who who's aspiring to the, to uh, to be a Dominican friar, uh, you know that 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 connection with Jesus in the Eucharist uh, would would be essential, and I would say Eucharistic adoration would be something that would be very helpful for someone who's discerning a vocation. Yeah. yeah. And I'd, I'd like to add too, for the active side, I'd encourage uh, a young man who's interested in the order to try to become, say, a lector, so that he would be able to, to be comfortable with the word, as well as comfortable proclaiming the word in front of, in front of, uh, of a congregation, since that's such an integral part to our preaching. I would also encourage a young man to get involved with uh, a particular apostolate. So we have had men in the Knights of Columbus who have been involved in the Knights of Columbus and the Knights of Columbus provides a context for outreach of service so they can grow in the virtues, particularly the, the virtue of charity. I mean, so, and living that tension, the tension between uh, the contemplative side where you wish to pray uh, in the silence of your heart with the Lord and then to go out and to proclaim the good news. That tension, which is at the heart of our charism, is what, in many ways, as, as my novice master told me, he said, if you're faithful to that tension, you'll become a saint. 
and, and just learning the ways of the Holy Spirit so that you know, okay, now it's time to pray, now it's time to go and preach, and, and learning that balance within a community. That's part of what uh, every Dominican aspires to. And I would say also uh, teaching the faith. So, for example, there's always a need for, for, uh, for CCD teachers teaching the catechism to, to children. Yeah. Uh, that would be that's an extraordinary way to, I mean, because you, you have to put it into different terms and you have to communicate it with, with conviction and with zeal and you have to witness to the faith as you teach it. So, uh, and that's, uh, that's something definitely that, that, uh, that as you practice that, Dominicans yeah. do that. Yeah, that, that's a great practice is teaching. Mm -hmm. When I was in graduate school working on my dissertation, I would go and teach catechism to the grammar school at the local parish after the daily mass with the grammar school kids. And I especially focused on the first and second grade. That keeps you sane <laughs> when you're trying to deal with big thoughts. All right, let's... Uh, deal with another question, but this time from our studio audience. Father, where are you from? Connecticut. Great. And what is your question? First question. Did St. Dominic actually see the Blessed Virgin Mary? Second question. Did he actually preach the rosary? Third question. What do the brothers do? With what? With your community. Do you have brothers? Lay brothers. Bro lay brothers. Yes. Okay. So, okay. so first question. Okay. Um, well, those are. I'm, I'm not a Dominican historian, but uh, but um, the uh, the process for canonization for for, for Saint Dominic makes reference specifically to uh, to experiences where uh, where the brothers gave testimony of the Blessed Virgin Mary actually appearing to Saint Dominic. They that you know where Dominic actually shared with the brothers that the Blessed Mother had had appeared to him. So so we know that, that the Blessed Mother certainly. Uh, it seems, uh, appeared to St. Dominic and, and shared with him uh, the mission of the order. And, and, and the second question is, did he actually preach the rosary? Yes. And now, we, uh, first of all, we know that the rosary historically predated uh, St. Dominic. But the rosary as we have it in its current form of the, the, um, the mysteries of the rosary the joyful, the sorrowful, and the glorious mysteries, these were actually assembled and put together by Dominicans uh, after St. Dominic. So he's sort of an in-between stage there. Yeah, now is it, is it, certainly is it possible that, that the Blessed Mother gave St. Dominic the rosary? Well, the tradition has that, the tradition of the order has, has had that because the order, because the rosary as we have it today came to the church through the Dominican order. And right. so, so we can say that it came from St. Dominic in that sense, but did but as we have the ros as we have the rosary specifically as it is today because the rosary over the period of of uh, of, of time developed it, it right. was not it was right. in, in different forms right um, right there is one form of the rosary that was all our fathers another one that was all hail marys yes and so right. we got, now we have the combination of the two yeah and and, and particularly the, uh, the the mysteries of the rosary that were that were actually uh, arranged for the, for the rosary that's 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 a, that's a Dominican creation, and and of course it's 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 the life of Jesus and Mary, and it's it's the story of our faith, the incarnation. Uh, the Rosary is an incarnational prayer, and this is specifically what what uh, what Saint Dominic was uh, was dealing with at the time um, with 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 the various problems in the church. For example, one of the groups called the Albigensians, uh, one of the groups in the 13th century in, in in France and other parts of Europe, they were dealing with uh, with um, uh, a group that that basically uh, uh, held um, uh, 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 everything spiritual to be good and everything material to be evil, and that somehow uh, everything spiritual was of God and everything material was of the devil, and they fought over human souls. And Dominic countered that through the, preaching of the, th through the uh, incarnational preaching and the Dominicans counter that after St. Dominic as well through the preaching of the rosary to show the goodness of creation, the goodness of every person created in the image and the likeness of God, made to love and to be loved with, with, a, with, a, dev with, a, with a divine destiny. So this is what, so this, th these all things, these things all um, play into the rosary and they, and they contribute to a spirituality of the rosary and the preaching of the rosary as Dominicans do it today. And then do you have lay brothers and what do they do? We do. So uh, it, it's interesting. Uh, the best understanding I have of the lay brother was conveyed to me by one of the older brethren. The, the lay brother is the true contemplative in the Dominican 
of, in the Dominican friars. So the Dominican priests, we, we basically go out and preach the gospel. And so our life necessarily involves the tension of, of, of living in the cloister, living the, the contemplative life, and then going out and serving God's people. The lay Dominican uh, brother, and we have Martin de Porres, who is, who is the great exemplar of, of the lay Dominican brother, basically is a man who is called to serve God primarily in the, within the, 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 the context of the community. And, um, and in that way, he, he preaches with his very life. He might not uh, have an active ministry. Now, we do have lay brothers. Uh, we have one lay brother in our community who is a nurse and a very well-accomplished nurse, and he serves as the dean of a nursing school in, in, um, Nashville. in Nashville. So we have brothers who are, who are also uh, very involved in the active side, and yet we have brothers who are also, in many ways, involved with the internal life uh, of, our, of our houses. And, and, and there, they are able to pursue in, in the contemplative life, in a sense, in its more fuller, in its more fuller context. Good. Well, we have a call from Sonia. Hello, Sonia. Hello. Good evening, Father Mitch. How are you? Where are you from? I'm calling from Alabama, Father. Great. And what's your question? Father, uh, uh, well, first, God bless you, Father Coel and Father Austriaco, for being priests. Uh, the older preachers, indeed, is um, what the figures, St. Dominic, St. Thomas, St. Dom uh, Thomas Aquinas, among others, were distinguished uh, great minds. How do you make them relevant to the young men and women who are seeking the truth and the meaning of life in this, uh, if you will, highly technological savvy environment today? How do we make the, the, the Dominican what? vocation? Or? No, how do you make uh, the great thinkers like, like St. Dominic and St. Thomas Aquinas relevant to young people today? Well, I mean, let me respond to that as a professor. So uh, a year ago, I, I had a student who was in my Introduction to St. Thomas Aquinas class, and we went through the Summa, and basically one of the things he learned was he learned about listening to someone who was uh, struggling with the truth, but he also was able to explain his faith in a very reasoned manner. And this past summer, he went, my student went off to Cornell for a summer research experience in a biology lab. And in that laboratory context, he was asked numerous questions. And he, what he simply did is he pulled out his iPhone and he pulled out the summa that he had on the iPhone. And he was able to take the ideas that he learned in the summa and provide some rudimentary but very robust responses to the questions that the other students in the lab had posed to him. And the thing that surprised his interlocutors was that he was able at 20 years old to give a reasoned defense of his faith. And Aquinas, in his very systematic account of the faith, provides you with a model, not only with the answers, but just the approach for trying to explain the faith in a way that's intelligible to people. And so the, the answers are timeless. It's all about Jesus Christ. And, uh, and he provides every single example. You know, he, there's so many objections and, and responses to objections, and these challenge us to think about how we could explain the, how, can we, how we can answer these questions to the people of today. Okay. Okay, good. All right. Uh, let's take a question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from New Franklin, Wisconsin in the Green Bay Diocese. Great. Good. Good to have you here. And what's your question? Well, um, I heard you talk that the OP behind um, your name stands for Order of Preachers, and I was just wondering, in trying to preach the gospel, how do you fulfill that charism? Um, you know, I, one of you said you were assigned to parish, and is that common for your priests to be assigned to parishes, or do you do parish missions? Do you get out across the country um, to give missions, and if so, how do people arrange for that? And a second question is, do you also run schools? Is that um, part of how you carry out that mission in running schools? What age groups of schools do you run? And do you have any high school seminaries? So I'll respond to that question. And I'll respond using the province of St. Joseph as a context for, for, for my response. So in our province, uh, we have several apostolates. We run two schools. 
uh, we run, uh, we, are, we administer the Dominican House of Studies, which is a graduate theological institution in Washington, D.C. We also uh, have Providence College in Providence, Rhode Island, which is a four-year liberal arts college with 4,000 undergraduate students and several hundred graduate students. The, 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 the province is also responsible for 15 or so parishes, I think. We have, we have numerous parishes scattered from Maine down to, to Virginia and from the Atlantic Ocean out to Kentucky. Campus ministries. Campus ministries. We have numerous campus ministries, including the campus ministry at uh, Johns Hopkins, at the University of Delaware, um, Dartmouth. Dartmouth. University of Virginia, UVA, New York, Yale, and then PC, New York University. So, so, we, and then we, of course, we do have missions. Uh, we run, we, we, as individual friars, go off and preach parish missions. I try to preach one parish mis- mission a year, just so that I keep in touch with the with with um, the Catholic in the pew. Since I, my my ministry is so much focused on college students. Uh, we don't have a, a high school in our province, but uh, the central province, the, the Dominican province that's centered in Chicago, has, has, a, right. has Fenwick High School. Right. Right. And we also have uh, foreign missions as well. So, for example, right now, um, well, our, our province has been involved with, uh, with a number of different foreign missions in the, in the past, but right now our responsibility uh, given to us by the, by the master of the order, the, the successor of St. Dominic, uh, is is um, our Dominican mission in East Africa? So we have we have responsibility to to bring the Dominicans and to strengthen the local church in Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, and Southern Sudan. And I was in Kenya actually for five years. And um, so, but there's there's plenty of opportunities to preach the gospel, <laughs> and uh, and it's it's multifaceted. And if you look at the all the different possibilities of the order throughout the world, it's it's um, it's amazing all yeah, the different ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, that's one of the great things about the older orders is that uh, we've got so many of these ex- experiences available to us, so many uh, apostolic uh, opportunities, opportunities because, you know, we've been asked to do things and I'm sure, you know, we, we Jesuits get asked and Dominicans get asked by bishops to, to help out in various situations so that that opens up a lot of possibilities. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Uh, mm-hmm. All right. Good. I have another question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Uh, actually, I'm from Universal City, the Archdiocese of San Antonio. And Great. Universal City is a suburb of San Antonio. And what's but your question or comment? My, my comment is regarding what uh, Father was saying about the student that came and asked him, uh, how can I meet Jesus Christ? Uh, I was born in France, and I was a uh, baptized Catholic but I was never raised in a faith. And when I met my wife 25 years ago, um, she shared with me Jesus Christ because she was in love with Jesus Christ. She shared how we give her strength uh, when she went to adoration and on everything she did, everything was Christ-centered. And uh, it, it makes such an effect on me that I ask her and I say, uh, can you try to give me an appointment with your preacher? And she said, we don't have preacher. She said, we have priest. And I said, well, this is fine. So finally, after two or three times, because the first time she was not too sure, she was trying, thinking I was trying to get on a good size. After the third time, uh, I was able to meet the priest and uh, to explain my situation. And uh, I went to confession, received the Eucharist, and uh, I fall in love with Christ. And it it is such a a thing to be able to preach, because now I'm a deacon in a Catholic church, to preach and to share Christ is such a joy. But the thing that is the most important uh, that I see tonight is you wearing your habit and Father wearing the collar. That, I think, is the first step of evangelization and preaching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to respond to that? Yeah, well, we, uh, we certainly wear, wear our, our habits, <laughs> and uh, we don't always wear the black. Uh, we usually wear the black for formal occasions or if it's cold outside. Um, but yeah, uh, the habit is a sign of our, of our consecration, the, 
the scapular is actually blessed and it shows our consecration to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, and um, also it's a sign of our fraternity and our brotherhood together and of, and of the common life that we live together. And, uh, but I think it's, it's true what he said about uh, uh, the wonderful gift of sharing the faith with people whom you love who are closest to you. If we can accomplish that, if we can do that and just witness to that, to that love and just that simple witness is what, is what drew you to the faith and, and here you are, you're a deacon today. <laughs> So we thank God for that. And one of the things I've discovered too is just for example today, uh, my flight here to Alabama involved a layover in Detroit. And I was in my Roman collar and as a, as a Catholic priest. And a woman just simply stopped me and we had a conversation and she wanted to ask me a question. She wanted to share some difficulties that she was having in her right. life. Right. And she wanted uh, us to pray uh, with each other. And, and I think that part of you know, every Christian has a responsibility and a great privilege to witness to Jesus Christ. Um, our charism highlights that for us, this has to be the driving goal, the end of, of our very existence, of our, of our prayer and our apostolate. But every single Christian who has met Christ should in fact be willing to share that faith with everyone else that he or she meets. I, um, I think it was somewhere that uh, uh, John Paul II said that, that um, that if, if your faith does not, um, uh, you know, drive you to, to share that faith with, with other people, then somehow something is lacking in your faith. I forget where uh, he said that, but, um, but I think it's, it's the very essence of what it means to be Christian. It's, it's the call of our baptism. It, it's what it means to follow Christ, to share our faith. And it's, and it's sometimes perhaps the most difficult with people that we love at home. Um, but I think it was uh, even St. Francis of Assisi that said, that preach Christ at all times, if necessary, use words. Um, the Dominican would never say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you guys got to use words. <laughs> yes, but but I think there is something to witnessing to Christ and to witnessing to the to the love of Christ with, especially with those who are closest to you. Um, you know, I you know I think that uh, obviously for Dominicans we don't we don't um, you know tell people that they have to believe this or have to believe that. We we point to the truth who is Jesus. We point to the person of Jesus Christ and we draw people through Jesus into God who is Father, Son, and Spirit and let them uh, move towards that truth, the truth who is God, the living God who has come to, has come down to us and has extended his hand to us in this beautiful invitation of, of his love and mercy. You know, it, it, it brings up the, the fact that this the last gentleman mentioned you know, you wearing your habits, my wearing my clerics becomes a way to to evangelize, you know, just to, to give something of a witness. And I think this brings out how important it is for the laity to wear some sign of their Christian faith, you know, a crucifix or a miraculous medal or something else that lets people know, look, you know, this is important to me. And if you want to ask me about it, I'll talk but I'm going to make sure that you know who I am and that that's one of the great things about wearing some sign of our faith. Or even just putting a cross on their office desk. Right. I've actually told people, I said, if you want to start evangelizing, just put a cross on that desk. And people are actually going to ask you about that and it will be an opening for you to speak about your faith with, uh, in Christ. Right, right. And, and, and then the, the next thing, though, is to do the same thing that you Dominicans do, uh, which is to have that sense of contemplation of the facts of the faith. You know, contemplate the gospel. Make sure that you take some time to, uh, you know, meditate on what it is that we believe. And uh, so that when you are asked these questions, you have an answer ready. And that's uh, very important. You know, St. Peter told us that in First Peter three fifteen, you know, to always have an answer ready, a defense ready for the, the hope that you have in Christ. Um, you know, this is a very important element as well. Definitely. Yeah, so, well, you know, we're getting uh, close to the very end of the show. So uh, what I'd like you to do, if you would, uh, join me in giving a blessing to our studio audience and our, our viewing audience. May Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you. May he lead you in all of your ways by His peace and guide you along his paths. Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
And, you know, I, I always like to remind you that we can bring you these Dominican friars and all of our other guests because you bring this show to us. You know, we can't do this program without your help. Uh, it's truly a family operation and it's a, truly a family gift. So we depend upon all of you to be able to help us out in making sure that these programs go on the air. So we ask you, please remember to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll be able to pay all of our bills. God bless you and thank you so much.